with you this evening. It's delightful to see you all. Um, for this conversation with Solari Gentil as part of the Melbourne Writers Festival. My name is Leanne Sajadi and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Vision Australia Library. We are a national library service for some 18,000 people across Australia with a print disability. We make books available in accessible print and digital formats, including Daisy Audio and Braille, as well as building a community of readers and learners across the country. It is wonderful to welcome some of our members here tonight, as well as joining us online. If you're interested in learning more about our service and how we can work with you or someone you might know, please speak to one of our staff or volunteers here tonight. You can find us wearing our lanyards. In addition to our library service, Vision Australia offers supports for thousands of people who have blindness and low vision, providing services such as our seeing eye dogs. You will find information about how you can donate or even become a puppy carer for one of our very special dogs around the room. But please also ask staff if you'd like more information. As we begin this evening, we take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, recognising their rich history over tens of thousands of years as the original storytellers of this land. The Vision Australia Library is committed to the telling of First Nations stories and supporting the traditions of oral storytelling. It is tradition when we gather at Vision Australia to do a roll call and a description of the space in which we are meeting. So there are too many of us for a roll call, but we are in a large conference room. Our audience is seated and facing the stage. I'm next to the stage speaking at a lectern and our guests, Solari and Robert are sitting on stage. As everyone came in today, you may have noticed a chalk outline of a body on the floor, a little portent of the discussion ahead. Following this evening's conversation, there will be an opportunity for questions and then to have your books signed by Solari and Robert. Our local booksellers, Jeffrey, Jeffrey's Books from Melbourne, are with us selling a selection of Robert and Solari's titles. We also invite you to stick around for some drinks and nibbles, generously donated by local businesses, Croutons and the Purple Fig Bakery on Glen Ferry Road. A tiny bit of housekeeping. We encourage you to keep your masks on for the evening. Please have your phones on silent. Our bathrooms are through the corridor to my right. Please keep walkways clear and tuck any belongings under your seat. And if you do need any assistance, please speak with one of our wonderful volunteers or staff. I am now delighted to introduce Solari and Robert. Solari Gentil is the award-winning author of 15 novels, including the acclaimed Roland Sinclair series. Dr. Robert Gott is the author of 97 fiction and non-fiction books. He's pushing for his century with his new novel, Naked Ambition, coming early 2023. Please join me in welcoming Robert and Solari. Thank you very much. On, not on. Not on. Oh, now, is that on? Yes. People are not. Oh, okay. I'll just shout. <laughs> You'll have to excuse my coughing. <clears throat> I'm getting over a small chest infection, not COVID. Uh, now, Apart from Solari's writing, which is, of course, marvellous, she's also an incredibly talented painter, watercolour mainly, and gouache. She also grows black truffles in a highly productive truffiere in Batlow. She, it's quite a large property, your property up in Batlow. Oh, no, it's tiny. It's, it's, it's quite not... a tiny property, your property up in <laughs> Batlow. But it does have two truffiers on it, which is amazing. Uh, Solari is married to her chief research officer, Michael, and has two sons, Edmund and Atticus. I do. I would enumerate Solari's various awards, one of which is the Ned Kelly Award for Best Fiction for your novel, Crossing the Lines. But I'm not going to do that because uh, I'll just want to kill myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> because the only thing I have ever won is a meat tray in West Wyalong in 1982. <laughs> anyway, Solari, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> now, let's talk about this book. Well, we will get, we'll get to the book, but I want to talk about other things apart from the book because there's more to life than books. That's a good way to start a book talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, just give us... This book is a very, very difficult book to talk about because it's so slippery. It's so slippery, it's difficult to talk about it without giving small, even small spoilers away. Yep. But give us just a thumbnail sketch of what we have here. Um, the Woman in the Library is essentially a, a story within a mystery folded into the pages of a correspondence. It opens with a letter. The letter is addressed to Hannah, who is an established Australian writer. Uh, the letter comes from a, a character called Leo, and it's obvious that the two of them are friends. Um, you, this, uh, in the beginning, Leo is everything that any writer could hope for in a correspondent and a friend. He's, a, he's warm, he's friendly, he's admiring of Hannah's work, he's even willing to do research. But as the novel progresses and you see more of Leo's letters and you see one at the end of each chapter, the reader comes to realise that there uh, might uh. be... <laughs> All right. There might be something a little bit unusual about Leo. Um, he, for one thing, he seems to um, has, have a, a certain zealousness for investigations of murder. I think I can put that. Okay. All right. Go, go no further. Than go no further? Go okay. no further um, than that. So that's one part of the novel, and that's actually the, the framing of the novel. But within the, that, you also see the, the story that Hannah writes in response to the advice and the letters and the research she gets from Leo. You don't actually hear from Hannah directly, but you see the chapter that she writes after she receives a, a letter from Leo uh, telling her what she needs to know about Boston, uh, where he's located. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. That's no spoilers? No spoilers. No spoilers. And it was sufficiently unclear that <laughs> <laughs> people would simply have to buy this book. <laughs> now, one of the reasons I absolutely love this book is because it's not just a crime novel. It's actually a book about writing. Mm. Now, I, and I'm not saying... I am saying that there is some slippage here between your character, who is the writer, yes. and yourself in terms of process. And I want to give you an example, and then you can defend yourself. Okay. All right. Bring it on. Okay. Where are we? You have your character, the fictional writer, the real writer, as opposed to the internal fictional writer, she's talking about her process, her writing process, and she says, I am a bricklayer without drawings, laying words into sentences, sentences into paragraphs, allowing my walls to twist and turn on whim. There is no framework, just bricks interlocked to support each other into a story. I have no idea what I'm actually building, or if it will stand. Now, Solari, you are famous, that's not quite the right word, <laughs> notorious for having a very particular and eccentric writing process. Would you please talk to it? Talk to it, okay. So, and look, I, I, I used to be ashamed of it, but I am no longer, I'm out and proud. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an extreme cancer, so for those of uh, you have, haven't heard the term, writers exist on a spectrum. On one end are the plotters, and they outline everything before they write it. They down, you know, some of them down to the last um, bit of exchange of dialogue. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum are the pantsers, and they have no idea what's going to be on the, in the next paragraph, let alone in the next page or at the end of the book. I live on the extreme pantser end of the spectrum. I just sit down and I write and let the story unfold 
as it will, as I think you do, Robert. I do. But yeah. I, I do, but I don't do the other thing that you do. Okay. The other thing that I do, which Robert is making sound a little bit more salacious than it is, <laughs> is that I watch television when I write. You see... <laughs> now, I used to be really, really embarrassed about this because it sounds like, you know, like I didn't care about my writing. I'd just knock off any old thing while I watch Midsummer Murders. But it's, it's not actually the case. Um, I, I just actually write better when I'm actively watching television. And I, I always knew this, and I used to be a bit cagey about admitting to it because it sounds really bad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But then a little, uh, a few years ago, I, I did an event, the Emerging Writers Festival with Kylie Ladd. I don't know if any of you know of her. She's a wonderful writer, but she's also a, a cognitive psychologist. And she said to me, oh no, Solari, that makes perfect sense. And so she explained to me what was going on in my head. Uh, so apparently, the creative center of your brain is in your prefrontal cortex, which is that front part. The prefrontal cortex is very difficult to access directly. That's why when you lose a word and you're trying to think of it, you can never think of it, but you go away and you do something else and suddenly it pops into your head, that process. So I'm basically using that process for 100,000 words. I'm going away and doing something else and letting the words pop into my head. So yeah, by watching... Yeah, I think what she was actually doing was describing a form of mental illness. <laughs> So while I so I watch television, it's always it's never anything that requires a lot of engagement. It's always something that has a very steady and predictable rhythm, like Midsummer Murders or Lewis, the BBC crime dramas. Um, and it sort of it, I think it must occupy about thirty percent of my brain to watch the television show, and that just uh, you know distracts my conscious so that my subconscious can run riot and write the book. Um, so that's that's the process uh, which Robert is slandering. I'm not slandering it. I'm just jealous. <laughs> I'm just talking about it. <laughs> you must have come to. I know that because I am also a pantser, but I don't watch TV while I'm doing it. Um, you must have. Sometimes you know you reach a, a position, and I know you did when you were writing this where your character says at one point, there's a murder in the library, yeah. there are only four people there, yeah. the writer and her three new acquaintances. And it's very early on in the novel. End of the first chapter. And she actually says, I one... Had of, I had coffee with... I, I had, had my coffee with my... I had my first coffee with a killer. With a killer. Yeah. So we know... When you wrote that sentence, did you think, oh, no? I, yeah, look, I knew because I had no idea which one of them would be the killer. So I knew that when I did that, I was making a declaration and then that was a challenge because not only did, did the killer have to be one of those four people, but I had given the reader warning that it would be one of those four people so the reader would be watching them closely. Um, so part of, part of writing an effective crime fiction is to be able to distract and to, um, and to sort of misdirect the reader. But if the, if the reader knows that it's one of these, one of these four, um, then they're, they're paying very close attention. Uh, so that was part of the challenge. And I, I knew that when I wrote it. But, you know, it's the way it comes out. You've just got to yeah. keep... And, and that's what pantsers do. That's what happened. You must have been thinking, wow, that's a lot of television ahead of me. <laughs> I thought, well, I, I think I, I thought at the time if I can pull it off, this will work really well. Um, but now I have given myself a difficult task ahead of me. Um, and and yet, think. throughout the book, you never know. No. No, but, but the truth is I didn't know either until the end, because I'm a pantser. So the, one of the benefits of uh, being a pantser is plotters know who the murderer is at the beginning, and they may subconsciously telegraph that to the reader without even meaning to do so. Plotters, do, uh, pantsers don't do that because we don't know. Now, so this book, I think, is like a 
beautiful piece of cabinet making, literary cabinet making. It's incredibly complex, but we always know exactly what's going on. We are never, ever confused, and that is down absolutely to your control and to the clarity of your writing. And I love the fact that what we're doing when we're reading this book is actually watching a novel being written. Yes. <coughs> and we're watching it through the eyes of this person called Leo. Tell us a little bit about him, without giving away any spoilers. Okay, First I'll, of all, I'll, tell us who he's based on. Let's start there. Okay, so I'll start with being... It might give you a little bit of a spoiler, but I think it's worth it for the story of how this, how this novel began. I was actually writing the 10th book of the Roland Sinclair series, and that book is based in, in the US. And I wanted to base that book in the US because... Um, American readers had embraced Roland, much to everybody's surprise. And I wanted to, as a sort of a thank you and a nod, set a Roland book in their country. Problem was, this was early 2019, I had at that time not been to the US for decades. And I had never been to Boston, where I wanted to set the story. Now, it's one thing to want to write a story in another country as a, as a nod or a thank you. But you have to do it well. If you do it badly, you're just going to end up offending people. Um, so to that end, I, I was sort of in court, uh, caught in, in that sort of uh, paradox of, you know, would I go or wouldn't I or would I, you know, should I, should I set the book in Texas where I'd been uh, rather than Boston? But I did have a friend who was in Boston at the time. And uh, he was an American writer who I'd met here in Melbourne. And we had corresponded because he had been a fan of the Roland Sinclair series. So I wrote to Larry and I said, would you mind if I picked your brain while you're in Boston? He was there researching his own book. And with typical American largesse, he said, sure, no problems. I can do whatever you can need. If you, if you need me to look for somewhere in particular, I can look for it. And that was all fine. Um, so we started and, you know, I'd, I'd send Larry questions and he would send me responses. The, the problem emerged um, when I came to realise that Larry is actually a much better researcher than I am. So not only would he answer my questions, and Robert knows Larry, he's just that type of man. He's, a very, he's, a, he's, he's an historian and he's very particular. So he'd answer my questions but he would also send me menus and maps, suggestions for where people would eat. Then he started taking photographs of the sidewalks so I could see that they were cobbled and see how the snow plows sort of knocked the snow up on them. And then one day there was a murder about two blocks from where he was staying. And he thought, well, Solari's a crime writer. She might be very interested in what an American crime scene looks like. So he took himself down there after the body had been removed and he took footage of this murder scene. And so I'm in Australia. I received this email from Larry. I open the email, file attached, open the file, and up pops footage of what is very obviously a murder scene. And my husband happened to be standing behind me at the time. And he said, gosh, I hope Larry's not killing people so he can send you research. <laughs> and 99% sure that he wasn't, that he didn't, but it did strike me as a really interesting idea for a novel. So that's where The Woman in the Library had its genesis. But of course, I was writing the Roland Sinclair novel, so I sort of put it away. And all I knew about that novel was that it would open with a letter um, from Larry, who became Leo to protect the innocent. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so I just sort of shoved it away in the corner, and it just sort of lived there happily until I finished the other book. And then when I pulled it out, Leo sprang from the pages. In fact, you, you, um, Leo is actually a writer, or at least he's a trying. He's an aspirant writer. He's an aspirant writer. And yeah. he, yes, and he, he just simply cannot get his novel published. And you have him say something that is never said out loud, but because you have him say it, yeah. I think it's such a fascinating area for people to, uh, to well, to, to talk about. 
I'd like, I'll, I'll just read it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you've been told. I've been told. <laughs> I can read it. It'll save my voice. Um, uh, is that one up there? Okay. Okay. <coughs> All right. Solari should have brought her glasses. Okay. So this is uh, Leo, is, this is in the midst of a letter from Leo to Hannah. On less important matters, I received a letter from Alexandra who says that while she enjoyed reading the opus, she regrets she cannot offer me representation. I'm not sure she actually regrets it, but that's what she wrote. The reality is, I suppose, that I am a straight white man with no diversity or disadvantage to offer as a salve for the fashionable collective guilt that rules publishing. I understand that popular correctness demands that men like me be denied to compensate for all the years in which we were given too much. I just wish I'd had a chance to enjoy a little of that privilege before it became a liability. Anyway, she said no. So there we are. Yours, Leo. Now, how do you want readers to respond? How do you think readers would respond? Where, where is the dividing line? Look, I think... I don't know how readers will respond. I think it depends on who you are as a reader. So there will be certain readers who will have sympathy for Leo for a number of reasons, and there will be other um, readers who will see him as an example of the problem. Um, so, you know, I don't mind. A lot of my, my belief about novels is that they are conversations. And it is the job of the writer to raise a conversation. It's not to give all the answers. It's not to do all the speaking. It's just simply to raise the ideas and begin the conversation. And would you have some sympathy for... Yeah, um... I do. I do. And look, we were discussing this before. I understand that Leo is part of the problem, that part of, part of, part of the, the issue is that when you have had generations of privilege having that privilege taken away seems like a discrimination. I understand that. But I also understand what it's like to be excluded, to feel like there's a club somewhere and you're not allowed in. And it doesn't matter whether Leo is right about whether he's being excluded or why he's being excluded. He does actually feel excluded. Um, and so I have sympathy for that because that is a very frustrating and undermining feeling to feel like you can't get in. And there are generations of, you know, people with disabilities, people of colour, women who have experienced that. And so we, we understand that feeling. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's a funny sort of conundrum. The fact, the, it doesn't matter whether he has a right to feel that way. The fact is he feels that way. And so I have sympathy for that. Uh, not necessarily for his position, but sympathy for that frustration. Or empathy for that yeah. frustration, rather than yeah. sympathy for that frustration. There's a second, there's a second Leo yeah. in this book. Yep. And again, even though there are two Leos, it's not in any way confusing. Yep. This Leo is also a writer... And he says something, and it's very short, so I will read it, because it's only a couple of sentences. Yeah. <laughs> he says, the mystery writers, the historical novelists, the political thriller writers, the science fiction writers, everybody but the people who write instruction manuals is writing romance. We dress our stories up with murders, discussions about morality and society, but really... We just care about relationships. Do you agree with him? Yeah, I do. I do. I think, um, I think, I, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily classify everything as romance, but I think it's relationships at the heart of every novel. Whether that relationship is a romantic relationship or a, a fraternal, paternal, maternal relationship, it's a relationship. And that's what moves a novel. Yeah. You can write all the action you want in the world. You can write beautifully about landscape, but if there is no relationship, the book is hollow. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably true. Hmm. 
I, I, yeah, I, look, I, I think, in, you know, it's, it's a funny sort of thing. People sort of revile when they hear the word romance because it's, it's one of those very slandered genres where it's equated with sort of trashy, pulpy, um, non-literary Right. But that's not really what he's talking about here. No, is he's, he's talking, about, talking relation about relationships. Yeah, he calls it romance, yeah. but, he, but, but what he's talking about is relationship. And he's right. I, this, I, I agree with him. I wouldn't have put it quite that way, but I do agree with him. I think if you, if you try to write a novel, I'm trying to even think of a novel without a relationship at its heart. Even novels, I'm trying to think of... Um Novels that are deep people, so novels that are you know that have that are about animals, say. Yeah, even, an, even yeah, those. Animal Farm. It's all about the relationships. Yeah. You know, in Animal Farm, the most moving thing was the horse. <laughs> um, you know, the the old steady horse who was sent to the knackery. Um, but even all. Of oh yeah, things are, like Bambi. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. But at, at the heart of it is is what we're really interested in is how people or beings relate to one another and what makes us love, what makes us hate, uh, what makes us jealous, what makes us passionate. Um, and I think that's always at the heart of novels. Yeah. So in late 2019, in no November, mm. um, you, me, Jock Sarong and Emma Viskic were uh, sent on an Australia Council grant to America to spread the word about Australian mystery writing. And while we were there, did you get some sense that Americans read... Did, did that trip give you some sense that Americans read fiction differently from the way we do? And did that influence the way you ultimately wrote The Woman in the Library? No, I, did. I don't think that they did. I, I, if anything, I thought that Americans, because of their traditional position in the world, were a little bit more open than, than readers uh, in Australia to different types of fiction. So they seem to be, there seemed to be room in America for things that we would consider niche or, or too small to have a market um, so I actually found them very uh, surprisingly open and curious uh, about things and, and non-judgmental when they saw things that were different. So, you know, there were lots of occasions when we were, we were quite blunt about the difference bet differences between America and Australia and they were quite shocked but they seemed quite open to the idea that we were coming from a different uh, point of view. So one of the things I remember particularly, we were talking about how Australians are like the second place getter, that we are quite fond of losers. Um, and America is a culture where it's all about the winners. But in Australian novels, the protagonist is often a loser. He's someone who doesn't quite make it in some, or she is some someone who doesn't quite make it. You cannot have a character, I think, in Australia, in an Australian novel like Jack Reacher, who just wins at everything. Um, the Australian protagonist always has to have some kind of flaw, some kind of failure, because Australians particularly go, we, we, we go for the underdog and we love people for their failures. As, they you know, found we, the yeah. underdog thing really weird. Yeah, they, they, they're all about winners. But they were curious. They didn't... They, you remember they didn't say, you're wrong, you're ridiculous, you know, how on earth can you read that? They were actually quite curious to try it from our perspective. Yeah. Um, so I was quite, I was quite surprised. I, I went to America expecting Americans to be quite parochial and quite set in the way that they read. Um, but they seemed to be quite open and curious and really interested in the different perspective that you got. Uh, by being Australian and generous listeners. Yeah, I think. yeah. So it was, um, it was, it was quite. Surprising. But I didn't change my writing at all. No, no. I just wrote the way I uh, uh, have always written. And you can't, you can't write for a market. Uh, you can't write thinking that, um, you know, uh, you are going to accidentally seduce people into 
making your book a bestseller because, you know, Americans write, like reading about, I don't know, ice cream. So you put lots of ice cream in your books. That just doesn't work. Uh, you've got to stay true to the story. What's behind the, the title changes of some of your books for the American market? Well, because titles, titles like jackets are signals to readers. They're not about the book. They're actually a signal to the reader to tell them what they're getting. So, and in different markets, that has a different uh, meaning. So, for example, the, the original title for the woman in the library was Letters from Leo. Um, but the Americans changed that title because they said Letters from Leo sounds like a literary title. It does not signal crime fiction. And if you wanted a crime fiction audience, you had to signal crime fiction. They had this really interesting process. They uh, focus grouped it. So they started with 100 titles, and it got focus grouped back to the one title that won, and that was The Woman in the Library. Um, so I, I tend to not get too worked up about titles and covers because that's really the job of the publisher. You, the, the writer creates the story, and it's the the job of the publisher to communicate that story to the kind of reader who will enjoy it. So the, both the cover and the title basically shout out to the reader to say, this is the kind of story that you will like. Um, and they were right. They were right with the title and they were right with the cover. Crossing the Lines became after she wrote him. Mm. And the Roland Sinclair titles, oh, some yes. of them are changing yes. as well. So a few right-thinking men is a house divided in America. Um, Paving the New Road is Our Man in Munich. Uh, I can't remember half of them, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, there's a testament of character is where there's a will. Um, the most awful one is uh, All the Tears in China. They call it Shanghai Secrets. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, they know their market. They, they know um, culturally how those titles speak to their, to their readership. So you've just got to go with it and trust them. You know what my take-home message was from America? It was that they need to stop going on about all of the deadly animals in Australia <laughs> that can kill you. They, because yeah. we discovered that they have the deadliest animal in the world. And if you, at the Grand Canyon, there are signs that say, do not pat the squirrels. They transmit plague. 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 I, you notice that someone got bitten by a squirrel in <laughs> the woman in the library. <laughs> Just, <laughs> but apparently they don't bite often. But yes, Americans have this idea that Australia is really, really dangerous. And you can understand that because a lot of the, the books that are, the blockbusters we're sending off there are Rural Noir, which has the outback as this great lurking thing with, that's full of bushfires and snakes and, uh, and spiders. And yes, it is, but we know how to move in that outback. <laughs> <laughs> and so it isn't quite as deadly to us as it might be to them. Yeah, in this book, you talk a lot uh, about writing and reading, obviously. And at one point, Freddie wonders, I love this question, Freddie wonders if the morality of the writer affects the meaning a reader gets from the work. Where do you stand as a writer on that position? Is the uh, art more important than the artist? It's a big question. Just give a short answer. Uh, it's, it's a big question. Oh, look, well, you hard wrote hard. it. I know, but it, it's a question. A lot of, a lot, it, 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 it's a question. It's a discussion. It's a conversation. And I, and I think it's one of those things where your opinion changes from day to day. And sometimes I think, no, well, you know, you can't, you can't support the art of a, a moral person. So, you know, do I want to read a novel written by Alfred, uh, this, uh, by Adolf Hitler? No, I don't. Uh, what if it was a really good novel? No, I still don't. Uh, but by the same token, I love Alfred Hitchcock's work, and there's questions uh, about him. Um, did, did I... 
changed my opinion of To Kill a Mockingbird when I realised that, you know, um, Atticus Finch was supposed to have been a Klansman um, in the original draft. Mm, I might have. That's why I didn't read that book. I didn't read Go Set a Watchman because I was worried it would change. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's really difficult because artists are imperfect people. Uh, and while, and I think one of the characters was uh, was saying that you know he reads uh, the Great Gatsby every couple of years to remind himself that an imperfect person can produce a perfect piece of art. And I think that's true because F. Scott Fitzgerald was problematic. Oh, highly problematic. Highly problematic, but the book is beautiful. Yeah. Um, so it's just one of those. One of those questions that change with context, it just, it just depends. Uh, but it's, it's a conversation starter, and I don't know that I've landed um, on an opinion. Books, and I don't know, well, my books are certainly not about giving people answers. It's just about having conversations. And readers will decide for themselves what's right. I don't need to tell them. It's not about... Uh, writers don't stand on sort of fonts and deliver wisdom to you. We're just people. <laughs> we, we, we are no more wise than anybody else. We just try to reflect um, questions and conundrums and struggles in story. And it's often the case that books that claim to give the answer are giving the wrong answer. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. This book is blowing up in America. Yes. And it's blowing up in Australia, what's going on? Oh, look, I have a theory about that. I was, I was, I was, um, you asked me this question about a month ago and I didn't have any idea. I, you know, I said to you, I don't know what it is about this book as opposed to the 14 before it that suddenly made me an overnight success after 15 books. Um, and But I think I've sort of come down to an idea. Now, this, this book very particularly um, isn't wholly loved. So, you know, um, if you write a book that everybody loves, it doesn't go anywhere. So people love the Roland Sinclair series. Very few people hate it. And it has, it doesn't blow up. It doesn't blow up the way this book has. Um, but it's, it's like when you go to a, a book club event and you know the, the books that everybody in the book club loves? The conversation's over in 10 minutes. Yeah, we all loved it and everybody moves on to wine and cheese. Uh, but if you have two or three people in the book club who hated it, then the conversation is really good because you get that. You get the argument. So this book, because of the framing device, there is a good 20 to 30% of people who don't get it, who hate it. And I think it's that that keeps it as a conversation in the, in the publishing world. There are peop people feel very strongly one, one way or another. So they, this, they either love it or they hate it and they fight about it. So that means that it's in the conversation. Uh, for longer than it otherwise would be, which is my explanation for why it's doing so well. So my, my theory is that books that are bestsellers are, are books that polarise people one way or another. And I think the ratio has to be something like 70-30. You need, first, yeah, you need a, enough people to actually be heard and not be drowned out, but you don't need them to be more than the people who like it, because that's a problem too. <laughs> so th that's my wisdom on how to write a bestseller. <laughs> that is an interesting theory. It, it is. <laughs> I was explaining it to Michael Robotham last night. <laughs> I don't know if he believed me. <laughs> this is also a book about um, friendships and betrayal and the virtues of loyalty and trust. Mm. In your view, is there a virtue that is pretty much overrated? Okay. So, not valueless, but overrated, um, I would say honesty. Why? 
because I think honesty is used as a weapon in modern society. It's used as a weapon to be cruel. It's used as a weapon to alienate people. It's used as a justification for racism or misogyny. I'm just being honest, you know. Um, and so honesty by itself is not, is not of any value. Um, truth is a different thing. Um, just saying what you believe honestly doesn't necessarily mean you're speaking the truth. It just means that you're speaking honestly what you believe. And if you, what you believe is ridiculous, you'll still say it. Um, I remember very much a point in Australian politics where there was a movement against political correctness. And that was the, the point at which people felt it was okay to come out and say things that were normally taboo. So things that had previously been taboo, racist things, misogynistic things, on the grounds that they were not being politically correct and they were being honest. So that would, if I had to, if I had to pick a, a virtue that I think is overrated, I would say it'd be honesty. Interesting. And you? Oh, mine is always piety. Pious people are the most boring people in the world. <laughs> Uh, Solari, despite what you might say, yeah. I know that you are an incredibly disciplined person. What is your greatest extravagance? How do you not reward yourself, um, but what is your greatest extravagance, would you say? My greatest extravagance? Yeah. I'm very extravagant. Mm. I don't actually deny myself a lot. Um, I have four dogs because, you know, they're cute. Um, <laughs> I have two donkeys for no other reason than I wanted two donkeys. <laughs> um, this is no one's idea of extravagance. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I'm thinking of five-star hotels. Okay, all right. You're so thinking of donkeys. <laughs> my most extravagant thing, um, the most extravagant thing that I have ever done in my life, I'm going to be doing soon, I have an American tour coming up. Uh, where I'm going to the US to tour with the book. And on the way home, instead of coming straight back to Australia, I'm going to the U UK, ostensibly to sign a few books at Waterstones or whatever. Uh, but I'm meeting my sister there, and then we're catching the Eurostar down to Paris, and we're getting on the Orient Express to Venice. <laughs> and that is probably the most extravagant thing I've done in my life. Uh, but it's research. <laughs> You're not taking those donkeys with you. No, I'm not taking the donkeys. <laughs> um, but, you know, other than that, um, I think... No, that's a good one. That's yeah, that's a, that's one. Yeah, that's, that, that's a... That's a problem. Yeah, but, you know, I, I kind of think that every day of my life is an extravagance. I have the privilege of being able to spend my life making things up. You know, it, that's, that's an absurdity in itself, that I live in a world so privileged that that's what I do. I sit around and I make stuff up. Um, so I am always aware of the sheer extravagance of my life. Where do you feel most competent? Um, where do I feel most competent? Um, I feel... Oh, gosh, that's really hard. I think, you know, I, this. I, I would like to say I feel most competent writing, but I suspect that some of what makes a writer a writer is a feeling of not being competent, is a feeling of, of, of striving, of fear, of not uh, making it. Um, I think, I feel I'm really, um, yeah, look, it's, it's really hard. I, 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 that's a really tricky question because I'm not sure that competence is anything is something that I strive for, as you know, because you've tasted my cooking. Well, my next question was, where do you feel, <laughs> where do you feel most incompetent? Well, I feel most incompetent in the kitchen. I'm a terrible, terrible that cook. That is true. Solara uses the smoke detector as a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
but, as a but, timer. But you know, the, <laughs> but but you know, I, I'm perfectly content with that, which is what I mean. I don't strive for competence. Uh, <laughs> just, I, I I I do my best in almost everything that I do. Um, but I'm perfectly willing to accept that that best may not be competent. <laughs> Were there writers who made you want to write? Um, no. Who are you reading? Who am uh, I reading at the moment? No, 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 no. Who were you reading growing up? Agatha. You, you don't become a, a, a writer, your kind of writer, with that kind of elegant understanding of an English sentence, unless you read. So who were you reading? I was reading up? Agatha. I was Agatha reading Christie? Agatha Christie. Yep. Um, I had a... Oh, when I was, a, when I was um, in uh, my first year at law school, I had a dear friend... And he was, he went on to be professor of classics at the University of uh, Sydney. And now he's professor of classics at the University of Queensland. But when I knew him, we were just kids and he was in law school doing classics and um, I, I was in science law. But I was moving with a group of kids. In those days, the, the, the majority of the kids or, that got into law school were from the, the very elite private schools. And I was moving with that that group of people for the first time. I'd come from the public public system. And what I found is that they were making all these literary references in ordinary conversation that I just didn't get. And it's not that my education had been lacking, it had just been different. They were very educated in the classics, whilst um, in the public system at the time in, in Queensland, it was a lot of Australian fiction and contemporary fiction and international fiction. And so I was, I was struggling because they'd make these literary references and I had no idea what I was, they were talking about. And every time I asked, I'd feel so stupid. Um, and so I, I cornered Alastair one day and I said, look, you know, this is my issue. You guys keep making these literary references. I have no idea what you're talking about and I feel like a fool. And he, and he said, oh, yes, you are rather culturally illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> and he took me. He took me to the um, to the arts library, and he gave me a list of things I had to read in order to become culturally literate. And on that was things like Wuthering Heights. There was the Iliad. There was Dante's Inferno, um, and there was about fifteen of them. And I dutifully went through and read every single one. Um, so there was that. So that might have been a late sort of Pygmalion episode in my in my life. But mostly when I was uh, when I was uh, a child or when I was a teenager, my uh, go to was um, Agatha Christie. I used to read fantasy fiction. I used to read David Eddings um, and so forth when I was a teenager. Um, and can't really remember. And um, Kill a Mockingbird was, you know, whatever was prescribed by the school. I read it. Um, I adore To Kill a Mockingbird to this day um, as a novel. Is there a book you know you ought to have liked but just didn't? Yeah, my brother Jack. You uh, are a monster. I hated my brother Jack. Hated it. And in fact, it turned me off Australian literature for oh a long my time. Oh, God. Yeah. No, I did. I was made to read it. Well, we, it was part of the school curriculum, and I hated it. I thought it made Australian sound appalling. We are appalling. Everybody was mean. <laughs> and, and I just didn't want... And so I stopped reading Australian literature for a long time. And I think, you know, I was immature. I was a child. I was, you know, maybe 15 at the time it was given to us. And I think now, if I read it now, I'd probably enjoy it. But at the time, I was just repulsed by it. Uh, repulsed by the whole story. And to me, quite often it's that relationship thing when Jack betrayed his brother by not standing up for him. It, they were all dead to me. I didn't want to read it. And, and again, it's, it, you know, it's that relationship uh, that's at the heart of it. And for some reason, I've always had fraternal, strong fraternal relationships at the heart of most of my books. So the Roland Sinclair novels, that fraternal relationship between Will and Roland is actually probably the strongest relationship in those, in those novels, which is interesting because I'm one of three girls. Um, so I've, I've, 
don't have a brother. And I, and I married an only child. Um, so the fir my first experience of the fraternal relationship was when I had my sons. Um, and it, it goes to show you that one of the things that, you know, it's not about writing what you know, it's about writing what, you were interest what you're interested in. So at the time I started writing the Roland Sinclair series, my boys were little, and I was just fascinated by this fraternal relationship between them because I'd never seen it, I'd never experienced it. And I, I think that's what uh, makes that relationship so strong in those novels um, because I was looking at it so closely. As a crime writer, you deal with issues of forgiveness. Are there crimes that simply cannot be forgiven? Of course. Of course, many crimes. Well, I mean, it, it depends on who you are. There are people who are capable of forgiveness for anything. Um, but I'd never forgive pedophilia, ever. That, that is not something I think you can come out of. Um, yeah, I've got a very low bar on this one. Yeah. You know, oh, you, you, <laughs> you know when you're driving into a car space yeah. and a car comes in and steals it from you? Yeah, that's, that's rough, yeah. <coughs> if I had a gun, <laughs> Melbourne's car parks would be... Yeah, I was thinking you were asking corpse. me a serious question. <laughs> no, it, wasn't. <laughs> it was a serious <laughs> question. It was a serious question. Um, I, uh, cruelty to animals is something that I have. So it, it just depends. It's, it's a funny thing. I think you could forgive murder, but I wouldn't forgive anyone who was cruel to an animal. <laughs> and, and the reason is, and quite often you see in my books, sometimes people are driven to murder for very good reason. Um, they still pay their, they still, the law is the law. They still have to pay the price, but um, it's a different thing. You're going to ask me that next question. No, I'm not, but, because we've gone over time. Yeah. Oh, have we? we? Oh, need, I'm sorry. Sorry? Questions, questions from the audience. So if, if there is anyone in the audience who would have a question, could you raise your hand? Yes. Oh, yes, there's a roving mic. This is very Thank you very much. Rock star. So first mini question. When you talk about panther, is that a fly by the seat of your pants writer or is yep. it something else? Right. So yep. when do you know... Where in the book do you know who the murderer is? Um, so I knew page 232. <laughs> I, I, knew, it, I know round about the time the reader realises, I realise. Or just before the reader realises, I realise. Um, and, you know, that works because, you know, it seems to me when I'm writing, I'm seeding there's sort of all sorts of clues and red herrings and I'm trying to decide which person did it and there's a strongest argument for one over the other. And the reader reads that at exactly the same time too. You've got the strongest argument. Realistically, you know, in a novel, any person can do it because the author can just create that scenario. Uh, but the way I pants it is, and to make it coherent and to make it fair play, it's the person that you can create the strongest argument for in the end that fits most needs, uh, fits best, uh, but is still a surprise. Um, so it was, you know, I was leaning towards one person until about page 233 or 4, and then I realised. I thought, no, it's not X, it's Y. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, another another question? Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, pants yeah. So it means writing by the seat of your pants. Yeah. Okay, so my, my structures is, so when I'm actively writing, so when I decide, okay, this book is going to be delivered in four months or whatever, I write a thousand words a day. I uh, never write less, uh, 
but I quite often just stop in the middle of a sentence once I've got to a thousand. And you try to stop in the middle of a, if you stop in the middle of a sentence, it means that the next day when you pick it up, it's a lot easier to get going. Then it takes longer. Um, so some days I write that thousand words in an hour and a half, and some days it takes me eight. Stop the back can't hear you. Oh, sorry. My question was, what happens the days when it's just not flowing, okay. um, and you've yep. got that deadline of a thousand? It just words. takes. So some days, I, I, some days I finish in an hour and a half, and I go out and do the garden or whatever else I want to do, or keep writing if that's what I want to do. And some days it takes me eight hours to get that thousand words, but I don't not get the thousand words. So. Theoretically, if you write a thousand words a day, in three months you have a novel. So a thousand words isn't huge. It's, you know, what is it, two and a half, three pages? Yeah. 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 It's not a huge amount, but if you can do it consistently, by the end of three months you'll have a novel. Um, so that's my, that's my discipline. Um, and, and the other thing is I just love writing. You know, it's not... The discipline for me is to stop writing and to cook dinner and feed the dogs and do the other things that And put out life the fires in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do the other things that life <laughs> requires of one. <laughs> uh, question down the back. Uh, Solari, do you only work on one novel at a time? And, <clears throat> sorry, and what are you working on next? Uh, no, I, I rarely work on one novel at a time. There's a... T there's a tail, but they're, but they're not moving in sequence. So as I'm finishing one novel, I'm starting another. And then as I'm finishing that one, I'm starting another. Um, so there, there is quite often two novels going at the time. When I do that, I allocate the morning to one and the afternoon to the other. Um, and and don't, don't cross them. So one's a morning novel, one's an afternoon novel. And I try to work in different rooms. Um, for them so that they feel feel different. Um, what am I working on? I just submitted uh, a novel to my agents and it went out on submission to publishers uh, three or four weeks ago and so they're expecting responses soon and I've got a number of ideas floating in the air. There's of course a Roland Sinclair novel uh, so that's about you know, half finished. Um, and then there's about three or four ideas competing for primacy. And one of them will win. <laughs> and I'll write that one, unless I come up with something different when I'm on the Orient Express. <laughs> and one, thank you, one final question. Oh, I've yeah. got a quick question for Solari, but you've got a question. Will you give us a little reading at the end? Yeah. And there's a question here. I've got the mic. Oh, hi, Slurry. Um, I was just wondering, um, did you ever watch Australian crime dramas Australian when you were growing up? Uh, what are the Australian crime dramas? No. Pop Shop? Oh, Homicide. <laughs> Homicide, Division 4. Matlock. Matlock. Division 4. No. Prisoner. No. Love I wasn't Pop allowed. My Blue mother... Healers, which I'm watching at the moment. <laughs> I vaguely remember my mother watched Prisoner, but we weren't allowed. It was considered a little bit too racy uh, but um, no it wasn't uh, I moved straight to BBC crime dramas um, I love the Australian crime dramas at the moment though mm -hmm. um, that are coming out uh, you know Mystery Road um, what are the other ones that are there I I've watched them all on Netflix I'm really bad with titles I just go through them um, and yeah but um, and, and it's, it's interesting, Australian crime dramas on, on Netflix or in production are different from Australian crime novels. And I was, wondering, I, want, I was wondering for ages what the issue was. And I think it is that when we do things on screen, we seem to leave out the humour, whilst Australian novels always have an underlying sense of Australian humour. Do you? Where was the humour in Mystery Road? <laughs> so, yeah. Which one? Okay. 
Um, so, yeah, well, I mean, my impression was watching a lot of the things that have come out more recently is that they, they seem to lack a sense of humour through them. They actually take themselves quite seriously, while Australian crime novels seem to have um, a certain Australian absurdity about them, a sense of absurdity about them. Sorry, did you have something? Who do you, like, m mystery and, you know, crime novels, or the crime in general, it, it exists both really well on TV and film and really well in books. What's, what's your preferred medium? Oh, I'll do both. I, look, I, this, you know, I, I write novels while watching murder mysteries. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can kind of do both. <laughs> yeah, so, so to me, there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship between them. And, and, and certainly when I write, my stories play out in my head like I'm watching them. Uh, and so I describe what I'm seeing on the page. Um, so I, I don't know that I have a preference for either. I'm not sure I could I could write novels without the without the television or the without the uh, without the you know without the the wealth of story I've got from that medium. So I think there is a kind of a uh, maybe screenwriting. Might yeah, be up your alley. <laughs> Um, yeah, so yeah, so I, I don't know whether that's a definitive answer, but I, 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 I think, you know, realistically, it's all wrapped up into one. In the end, it's all storytelling. Um, and, you know, producers and actors and filmmakers and novelists are all storytellers. Um, and in the end, that's, that's what's really valuable to me. Uh, do you want Slari to do a reading? Okay. Okay. A reading? I think. Yeah. Can I? I'll just get my glasses <laughs> because I do actually require them now. No. You know, in the old days when I only had one or two books, I used to be able to tell you what happened on what page. But I have this theory about memory and I think in order to write another book, you've got to download some stuff. And I think I've downloaded stuff, so I don't remember as as well as I used to. But, okay. Probably safest just to read the, the first one. The, the, the very opening. The opening. So this is the opening letter from Leo to Hannah. Dear Hannah, what are you writing? I expect you've started something new by now. If not. Consider this a nudge from a fan. You have a following, my friend, desperate for the next Hannah Tagoni. To paraphrase Spider-Man, with great readership comes great responsibility. Seriously, though, I saw an implausible country in the bookstore around the corner yesterday, a place called The Rook, one of those hipster joints where you can get a half-strength turmeric soy latte and a wheatgrass and birdseed snack. Thank you. 
Thanks, Larry. Thank you so much for coming out to this event. We really, really appreciate it. And, and could you please thank Solari? Wonderful. So thank you so much, Solari and Robert, for such a wonderful conversation. Such a treat to hear about your unconventional writing process and the genesis of The Woman in the Library, and as well as your reflections on who we are as readers. Thank you so much. Um, so before you all go home, there is an opportunity to purchase one of Solari or Robert's titles from Amy from J Jeffrey's Books um, and to have your book signed. So there is a signing table up the back. You can meet Solari and Robert there in a few moments. Um, otherwise, please help yourself to some food and drinks. Our volunteers are ready to assist you. And we fa farewell those who have joined us on the live stream. Thank you again for joining us this evening for In Conversation. We hope you can join us for another In Conversation with the Vision Australia Library in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.